I'd like to start with uh, uh, Mr. Gallarducci. Um, we'd asked you to provide us with an update of OES's transition back to the governor's office, including the incorporation of public safety communications and uh, how that's going, the status of OES and its budget uh, given the declining federal homeland security dollars, uh, what's happening on the federal level that uh, we can look forward to or be concerned about or at least be able to anticipate so that we can try to address those issues. And um, an update on the emergency management assistance compact uh, and resource sharing between the states because I know we're going to hear about the fires that are going on in other states in California to which I uh, believe we're probably responding uh, among other things. And then your priorities and goals in the near and long term. And so uh, pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to see you here. And uh, if you'd go ahead and proceed. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Chairwoman Jackson and Vice Chair Lowenthal, members of the committee. It is really uh, my pleasure to be with you today and, and, and particularly uh, a great pleasure to, to be sitting here with my great interagency partners, uh, General Baldwin uh, from the Guard and, and Chief Pemlaw from CAL FIRE. We work so closely together uh, in addition with, with Commissioner Farrow at CHP to make sure that the public safety programs of California um, uh, occur and that we keep everybody as, as safe and prepared as possible. So I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, our principal objective really is to reduce the vulnerabilities uh, uh, to hazards and to crimes here in California uh, through a series of programs that ensure for a resiliency within California, uh, which include things like emergency management and homeland security uh, programs and grants and criminal justice programs. And um, this last year, we actually have had quite a few exciting changes. Um, you know, as of July 1st, uh, you had mentioned, uh, Chair, that we have moved from an uh, uh, agency back into the governor's office. And I have to say that, um, you know, as, as far as that transition, it has gone so very smoothly. Uh, our authorities and our re uh, the regulatory part of us, our responsibilities have not changed. In fact, uh, as a part of GRP2, you know, we assumed um, the responsibility of, of, of managing and integrating the Public Safety Communications Office, which was uh, previously with the California Technology Agency and now is, um, is in with us. So it actually increased our roles to around 900 or so full-time uh, employees at uh, Cal OES. And, and um, Karen Wong, uh, who's sitting to my right here, will, uh, is the uh, uh, director of our public safety communications, and she came over, thank God, with, uh, with the whole team, because uh, she's very, very good at what she does, and she's going to brief you a little bit in a minute on, on more specifically how that's come together. Um, so... Um, this last year, we also did uh, some significant things. We, we actually, when I came in, um, uh, really needed to evaluate the department. Um, a lot of good work had been done, but as you remember, may remember, um, we had uh, two organizations, the Office of Homeland Security and the Office of uh, Emergency Service that were merged together um, and uh, to create uh, the Emergency Management Agency. And a lot of work really had been done to make that happen, but there were still gaps that needed to take place. And part of my uh, role uh, after talking with the governor was to, you know, sort of be the last mile, I guess you could say, with regards to getting that in place. So what I did is, you know, to fully integrate both entities and make us as robust as possible. I did several things. First, I uh, implemented uh, a, a reorganization within the uh, department that um, uh, merged the two entities completely together uh, to uh, have a much more um, integrated and effective response and recovery capability. And um, also, um, uh, built it around the incident command system so that now instead of us rolling in from a day-to-day -day operation into an incident command structure to manage an emergency, we as a department, a little bit different in the way normal state government departments are set up, we as a department are now fully set up under the incident command system so that we are in it every day, we are operating that way, and when we transition into an emergency, it is seamless and people understand their roles and responsibilities better. With that, we tied in an um, uh, extensive uh, update of our strategic plan and, and objectives, built in a performance measurement system, uh, which, will, which will be uh, uh, me measuring performance at every level uh, based upon our strategic goals and objectives. 
uh, tied to uh, federal guidelines, federal granting, um, particularly in the, in the context of the reduction in federal funds. We know uh, through Homeland Security reductions in grant funds that as time goes on, we need to be thinking smarter and more effectively and efficiently to be able to account for the loss in, uh, in these federal dollars. And th so far, the transition uh, into this new organization has gone smoothly. All the months of planning and the work with uh, CTA and with uh, Karen, Karen Shop have, have allowed for the integration of PSC to go very smoothly. And, um, uh, and so far, so good. I would say that things are, things are operating fairly well. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. We still have continual work to do, and uh, we need to be prepared for that. Uh, that, uh, that emergency that is inevitable, that disaster that is inevitable. So we have worked very extensively to build in and com complete catastrophic disaster plans for the Los Angeles Basin, the San Francisco Bay Area, and now just recently the Cascadia Subduction Zone, uh, which is basically Mendocino County North. And we just started to launch, we just launched a catastrophic dis disaster planning initiative for the Central Valley for a catastrophic flood. So we are really laying a, a very, very firm foundation in place that is all hazard and uh, all risk and being able to really address what is that super storm sandy scenario gonna look like to California? As you know, the last biggest disaster we've had that really stretched us with a lot of infrastructure damage was the Northridge earthquake. Um, and we really haven't had something to that size. And, and that, you know, by comparison to other big earthquakes, wasn't that big. So. We need to really think about the big one that's going to happen, and that really is the greatest risk to California, not just to the people, but to the economy, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so a little bit about our funding. Um, you know, we provide funding to our communities uh, to address their unique challenges through the use of federal homeland security funds, uh, through grant funding sources, uh, which includes both emergency management performance grants and homeland security grants. Um, however, these resources are not as robust as they once were. For example, in 2010, California received $268 million in homeland security grant funding. Uh, but in uh, fiscal year 2013, California received only $168 million in homeland security grant funding, roughly $100 million less in just two fiscal years. So while the 2013 numbers are slightly higher than what we received in 12, it's still well below what we received just a few years ago. And um, you know, this results in us having to really have an efficient operation, reprioritize, make sure that every dollar that's coming in is effectively used. And that also means that we need to have a greater connection with our local partners that are using those dollars so that they can make uh, whatever programs they have more resilient. Not just one-offs, not just a widget buy, but how do we make those programs long-term and more resilient. Um, and, and of course, despite the significant funding reductions, what I would say in the Homeland Security side, for fiscal year 2013, um, the emergency management performance grants, which come directly from FEMA, are relatively stable. Um, we received um, uh, about $26 million uh, in that, uh, it's California share. We passed roughly 55%, so it's, it's, it's like uh, $56 million, and then we, we pass uh, about 55% to local government, and then the other um, uh, remaining amount stays with us. Um, and these funds support programs such as uh, the performance uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, assistance to tribal and uh, other state agencies and local governments uh, for emergency preparedness and um, protection of life and property for all hazards, including tsunami um, and earthquake hazard reduction programs. Um, so, so, you know, and of course with Proposition 30 passing and, and the governor being able to stabilize the budget as he has, um, you know, we have been able to have a opportunity where we haven't had an in enhancement of our funds, but we've been able to stabilize our budget um, after all the budget cuts to be able to now have a better sense of long-term strategic planning and what I can count on and how we can then move forward. With the addition of PSC, it's been an interesting dynamic. You know, they have a little different budget model, so we're working to integrate their budget model into uh, Cal OES uh, to make a, a, um, a, you know, a more streamlined system. 
That said, you know, we're learning that, that down the road there are things like infrastructure enhancements that need to take place. We have a very aging telecommunications microwave uh, uh, system. Some of them are over 50 years old in our towers and, and, our, and our communication systems. If you go to the what we call the Network Operations Center, or the NOC, which is uh, really the heart of the, um, the entire state system, uh, they're still working on telephone wiring that we would have seen back in the 1950s. Um, this is not a good thing, and, and we need to really think about our resiliency because if that goes down, the state goes down, and that's not a, a position that we want to be in. So we're learning about that. We're kind of gathering it up and, and looking at what our next generation is going to be. Uh, and I know that in our next generation, 911, Karen's going to talk about that as well. But there's a lot of great, exciting things. And, and um, really now with PSC and, and OES coming together, it really builds that complete picture of full public safety from emergency management and fire and law enforcement, homeland security and communications all linking together. That allows us to give a better picture for you uh, on really what the needs are and how we need to be able to approach it. Um, in the area of, of, of security, I, I want to uh, mention that um, really kind of one of the biggest th threats we're facing today, uh, that we're, we're, or challenges I should say, um, that we're facing today, and this is not just in California, but it's a national and international um, a challenge, is that of a challenge of cyber crime and cyber security. Um, uh, it, is, it is one of my top priorities as we move forward in addressing this in the coming years in, in Homeland Security. Um, as, um, and what I've done recently is I, I partnered with uh, Director Ramos over at the California Department of Technology, and we've established a California Cybersecurity Task Force. And this task force is really an unprecedented alliance made up of state and local, private sector, industry, universities, other senior officials and experts in the field of cybersecurity um, to be able to come together to identify California's gaps, what our needs are, and how do we need to move the state forward to make the protections identify the low-hanging fruit, then the more complicated things. But because Silicon Valley sits within California, they are the engine that can help us get what we need to get done. And so I'm leveraging every aspect of that to be able to get them engaged in our cybersecurity task force. Eventually what I see is guidelines coming out, maybe through an executive order, uh, that will allow um, both private and public institutions, universities, et cetera, local governments to have a set of guidelines on operating their computer systems that will then harden them against um, any future attacks. We are, uh, for lack of a better term, a sieve of information going out, not just the state of California, but in general. Um, and we are getting pinged and hacked, uh, cyber crimed each and every day. So um, this is a, a, a great concern, and we want to be on top of it, and we're moving forward. So the goal of the task force is to position California in a way that we are more resilient and protective for all of our state. Um, I mentioned the performance measurements. Uh, one of the areas where we've also enhanced is we've taken, as you may have remember, uh, when I came on, there was a, a budget uh, uh, change that to, to basically eliminate the California Specialized Training Institute. Um, I, I pulled that back and um, uh, because I saw that uh, really you, you cannot respond and, and, and understand the emergency uh, um, programs without having a robust, robust training program. Um, and in, in, in the absence of having big disasters overall, you have to have good training and exercises to be able to get the job done. So I wanted to, to resurrect CSTI, but I wanted to build it in a new way. So we're building an enterprise. It's not a specific location, but it's a statewide enterprise. We're seeking uh, federal support for, uh, through the National uh, Training Consortium for Center of Excellence. We have uh, partners, partnerships that we're reaching out to with Cal State, uh, with UC, with the private sector, with various other state agencies, so that we've got this sort of joint powers authority, a joint powers agreement coming forward to move training forward in a very robust way. All of that will be tied to performance measures, not just at the state level, but in our local partners as well, so that we know that all the local emergency managers and everybody's dealing with emergency management at the local level all the way up to the top, to the federal level, all are uh, meeting a performance measure. And then I can tie the performance grants to those performance measures. So that's kind of on, ongoing as we move, move forward. Um, and then lastly, um, let me just say that um, 
You know, our mutual aid system in California still is, um, uh, bar none, the best, most robust mutual aid system in the world. Uh, that said, uh, we have actually had an impact uh, due to, to the budgets uh, on local governments who support they're the backbone of that mutual aid system. And we roughly have about 25% less capability in our ability to get resources to respond immediately to these big fires and other kinds of disasters. Now, you know, you may think that, okay, 25%, it's resilient, we can handle that. We can relatively handle it, but understand that with every percentage drop of capability and part participation in that system, um, it, it, it makes it for a slower response, which then allows fires to get bigger. Um, it allows uh, problems to, to, to get uh, more complex. So we really want to keep that system robust and supporting those, those responders, those first responders, the people that participate in the mutual aid system to ensure that we, we have that capability. As we sit here today, we have de deployed mutual aid assets, uh, both from local government, uh, state agencies, uh, the California Guard um, uh, in support of CAL FIRE and U.S. Forest Service operations for fires throughout California. And then uh, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, uh, Chairwoman mentioned, uh, this is a national uh, uh, emergency management compact agreement system. All the states in the United States are signatory to it. Basically, the concept is state helping state, and it's designed so that the state that's requesting goes through a process and makes a request for a kind of resource and then reimburses the state that's providing. And it's been very successful. We have been a receiving state in the past, but m more than often, we are a deployment state. And in fact, as we sit here, we have resources in Alaska supporting the state of Alaska with their flooding that they have going on up there. So uh, with that, I mean, just say I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to sit in front of you. I know you may have many more questions for me, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to answering any and look forward to working with uh, all of you in the coming year. I have some great ideas of how the legislature can can support uh, our efforts, uh, particularly on some new programs that are coming up right around the corner, and I look forward to talking to you about those soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Um